The plan had sounded so simple, the thief thinks to himself, one of many thoughts that ring loudly in his panicking brain. He wished he could hit a magic undo button to take everything back from the second it all started to unravel, anything to reverse what happened to the prisoner. Except it's too late. The beast lumbering through the dark lab is no longer the person that the thief once knew. It's not even human anymore. And what makes that fact even worse is knowing that it's all his fault. As he hears the heavy step of something more closely resembling a blob than a foot, the thief wishes he'd never found out about that cursed locket. Little more than a few months earlier, the would-be thief isn't quite ready to enact his plan yet. In fact, the idea hasn't even entered his mind and won't until a chance meeting. It's during this time that he's just an average researcher, working in the ranks of the SCP Foundation. Well, as average as someone in that line of work can be. Which is to say, he's a researcher who doesn't have the power to nullify reality-warping powers around him and is just an ordinary human rather than a talking dog in a lab coat. Chances are, if he avoids the encounter he's about to have, then our researcher could have a long-lasting future at the Foundation ahead of him. Not as the head of any of the major research departments, of course, more as an upper-middle management type, never really experiencing the safety and fulfillment that comes from making it to the top of the food chain, but still having a few researchers below his station that he can boss around whenever he's having a bad day. That course of action will all be averted, though, when he meets the prisoner. Sent to deliver a file to another member of personnel in the medical bay, the researcher catches the eye of the prisoner, a D-class personnel, denoted by the uniform. They get to talking, a perfectly innocent conversation. Then, as the days and weeks pass, the two of them see each other again and again. The prisoner never leaves the medical wing, confined to an uncomfortable bed. But despite all the discomfort he's experiencing, conversing with the researcher soon becomes the highlight of his days. It doesn't ease the pain, but it distracts him from it, at least for a few moments. After some time passes, the two's topic of conversation eventually turns to what landed the prisoner on this gurney in the first place. That's when everything changes. The prisoner explains his predicament, and it's quite a sorry story. He's got a terminal illness, and worse, the Foundation gave it to him. They want to test out the capabilities of an anomalous locket that, apparently, has nearly limitless healing properties. But in order to do so, the Foundation knowingly contaminated the prisoner's bloodstream. Now he's in agony, his cells practically destroying themselves as he approaches the late stages. It's only when he reaches death's door that he'll be brought in for testing with the locket. However, that could mean weeks or even months of excruciating pain in the meantime. Hearing about all of this makes the researcher start to well up. He's only ever heard rumors of this anomalous locket and knows that he'd receive disciplinary punishment if he acted against the Foundation. And that would be the best case scenario. Worst case, he'd probably find himself dosed up with amnestics and left on a sidewalk somewhere. But seeing the prisoner in so much pain and knowing there was something on site that could help him, the researcher couldn't deny his own sense of empathy. And so, he vows to help. It'd be the kindest, most well-intentioned mistake he'd ever make. It's just a shame that, like they say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. The thief tries to sneak through the corridors of the facility as naturally as possible. Nobody can know what he's just done, how he's just betrayed the Foundation. It'll cost him his job, his future, his whole life. His trembling fingers grip the cool metal of the locket as it sits in the bottom of his lab coat pocket. He catches the eye of everyone he walks past, the fear that someone's onto him, thumping in his chest. Does he know? What about her? They look too, what if they found out? With the stolen locket firmly in his hand and his hand buried in his lab coat, he retraces his steps back towards the medical bay. One good deed for the prisoner, he'd use the locket to heal him up then hurry back to the containment case to put it back where it belongs. That's the plan. Seeing the prisoner change before his very eyes somehow isn't the worst part. The formless mass of flesh that his body rapidly reforms into is certainly a horrific sight to behold, but to the thief, who could have just carried on as an uncaring researcher, the worst part is somehow the knowledge that the prisoner is gone. All that's left in his place is the monstrosity, and it's his fault. His good intention hadn't saved the man from his illness at all. Instead, hell is stalking the thief through the medical bay in the form of a terrifying flesh beast. And because no good deed goes unpunished, the unfortunate researcher turned thief doesn't live to see himself disciplined by his superiors at the Foundation. 
Instead, this newly created flesh beast reaches out and wraps its terrible claw around the researcher's throat. It tosses him across the room the way a child might carelessly throw a doll, and before he can stand, the creature is upon him. Tearing into him with all its disgusting new appendages, it's the only ending you can expect when dealing with the Lovecraftian locket. Jewelry. It's one of humanity's strange little quirks. Nowhere else in the world will you find another species, be it a mammal, an amphibian, a reptile, or otherwise, that finds joy in adorning its body with pieces of metal or precious stones. For some, jewelry is a signifier of wealth and status, and it's been that way for centuries. The crown jewels worn by kings in centuries gone by are just the precursor to someone wasting six months of their salary on a Rolex just to show off to their co-workers, who I guarantee aren't as impressed as they might pretend to be. Sorry, Gerald. Of course, in either case, there's nothing inherently special about any of these. They're all just material objects to be bought or sold. But let's say you were to possess a piece of jewelry that was actually special, perhaps even anomalous. Then you can bet that it set it apart. In fact, anyone who's anyone would most likely pay top dollar to get their hands on something like that. Sadly, you'll never find SCP-427 up for auction or being appraised at a pawn shop, although that might be for the best. To understand exactly what SCP-427 is, where it came from, and what it can do, you'll need to first become familiar with another pair of anomalies that the SCP Foundation currently has in containment. First and foremost, SCP-500. While the origin of these seemingly mundane little pills isn't known, or is at least kept classified by the Foundation, what they can do has been well documented over the years. SCP-500 is a small plastic container that contains a remaining 47 anomalous red pills. These pills are known to have near instantaneous healing properties, able to not only treat, but outright cure any and all diseases. The potential of SCP-500's use is nearly limitless when it comes to remedying various dangerous afflictions, even anomalous ones. However, the limited number of pills available forces the Foundation to use them as sparingly as possible. They have conducted a number of cross-tests using the SCP-500 pills, particularly for correcting anomalous conditions such as SCP-008, otherwise known colloquially as the Zombie Plague. Given its name, you can probably imagine what this disease can do. However, a dose of SCP-500 is able to offer a subject infected with SCP-008 a full recovery, even if suffering from the advanced stages of this zombifying disease. Perhaps as a result of seeing how effective SCP-500 was at treating anomalous ailments, one Foundation researcher puts in a request to use one of the pills in an experiment involving a second SCP. This researcher is none other than Dr. Charles Gears, a respected, long-serving, and high-ranking member of Foundation personnel, albeit a man known to have a little trouble when it comes to expressing any sort of emotional response in any given situation. Nonetheless, it is Dr. Gear's suggestion for an SCP-500 cross-testing experiment that, although he has no idea, is inevitably going to lead to the creation of SCP-427. And in order to do so, will involve the use of another anomaly, SCP-914, better known as the Clockworks. SCP-914 is a collection of various clockwork components, a mass of springs, gyros, gears, and cogs, all forming one giant machine with two booths labeled input and output, respectively. There is a dial between both of these booths, denoting a number of settings ranging from rough to very fine. The purpose of this clockwork contraption? Well, that's simple. Based on what setting the dial is turned to, SCP-914 will either destroy, dismantle, recreate, or refine any item or being placed within the input booth, and when set to the highest setting, very fine, the item being improved is usually given anomalous properties. So can you guess what Dr. Gear's suggestion was? He puts in a request for one of the SCP-500 pills for testing with SCP-914. Not all requests are approved, given how limited the number of pills are, but knowing what the Clockworks is capable of, and that refining SCP-500 has the potential to create a more effective version of the all-curing red pills, the Foundation higher-ups grant approval for Dr. Gear's request. He's cleared to go ahead with his experiment, and so is given one of the SCP-500 pills to place into the Clockworks input booth. Turning the dial of SCP-914 to the Fine setting, which usually improves an item but rarely adds any anomalous properties to it, 
Dr. Gears takes a step back to a safe distance as the machine whirs to life. Components start turning and ticking, the clockworks refining the little red pill it's been given, turning it from just one single dose into, well, not what anyone has been expecting. Dr. Gears perhaps most likely thought that SCP-914 would produce a new, more effective version of the SCP-500 pills. It's hard to see how a pill that cures all diseases could be improved upon, of course, but regardless, what the clockworks turned that one pill into was perhaps the furthest thing Dr. Gears or anyone else thought they'd get out of this experiment. After the noise of the clockworks grinding to life dies out, sitting in the output booth is an entirely new object. It's like the machine conjured it from out of thin air and made it brand new out of nowhere. It's not a pill, not even a serum, a topical ointment, or any other form of new and improved wonder drug. It's a locket, a piece of jewelry, an item that will henceforth be classified as SCP-427 once the Foundation learns exactly what this anomalous object can do. Naturally, Dr. Gears is eager to inspect and test out the capabilities of this new anomaly of his own, albeit accidental, creation. The locket itself is quite a beautiful thing a small metallic sphere made of a polished silver substance decorated with ornate carvings. As quickly becomes evident, the carvings on the surface of SCP-427 don't actually serve any inherent purpose, they just make the locket itself look more like an elegant piece of jewelry. As Dr. Gears and his research team examine the locket, they notice no unusual or abnormal qualities presenting themselves, aside from the anomalous nature of SCP-427's creation. Although that's only as long as the small silver locket remains closed, when it is then opened up for examination purposes, that's when they find something curious inside. Within SCP-427, visible when it's opened up, is a small glowing orb contained in the center of the locket. Worried this orb might be dangerous, Dr. Gears orders an immediate test of the anomalous item's radiation levels, but luckily, it is quickly discovered that the object at its center emits no radiation or energy of any kind beyond the visible light energy that causes it to glow. But having SCP-427 open, that's when something strange happens. One of Dr. Gears' research assistants possessed some rather severe burns on his skin, the result of an accident that occurred when the assistant was a child. However, upon opening SCP-427, it quickly becomes evident that the scarring left behind from the assistant's unfortunate burns have been rapidly healed. Dr. Gears is astounded and instructs another of his colleagues to open up SCP-427. The hand-picked researcher has been suffering with the common cold, sniffling and coughing all over the facility. Normally, a minor infection like that takes between 3 to 10 days to make its way through the immune system and eventually leave. But as the phlegmy researcher stands in the presence of SCP-427 while the locket is open, his cold is rapidly cured in the space of only a few minutes. It is soon determined that the healing properties of SCP-427 are emitted directionally, meaning that someone has to be standing within direct line of sight of the glowing orb at the locket's center. And of course, it doesn't take long for additional testing to take place. Only a short while later, Dr. Gears is placing requests to his superiors within the Foundation for any and all members of D-Class personnel with any long-term illnesses, physical afflictions, or any otherwise damaged biological tissue to be reassigned to serve as test subjects for SCP-427. Much like the SCP-500 pill it was refined from, the anomalous locket seems to have near-limitless regenerative capabilities. But unlike the little red pills, there is no finite number to worry about. Just stand in line with the glowing orb within, and all that ails you is cured. With an object like SCP-427, the world could truly be healed of all diseases and injury. Illnesses could be removed from human life entirely. Maybe that's Dr. Gear's intention, despite how cold and emotionless he seems. After all, who wouldn't want to heal the world? But like with a certain thief and a certain prisoner, Sometimes the noblest of intentions can lead to some nasty, unforeseen outcomes. The Foundation records don't indicate which was the first experiment with SCP-427 to produce the more undesirable side effect to its anomalous healing capabilities. Although knowing Foundation protocol, it's highly likely the subject of this experiment is a member of D-Class. And it's a safe bet that the outcome of such a disaster is what will give SCP-427 its new ominous nickname, the Lovecraftian Locket. The thing is, SCP-427 doesn't just heal, it improves. 
as it repairs cellular damage, acting in much the way SCP-500 does when taken orally. The locket also optimizes the natural systems of a person's body, and in one subject in particular, the Foundation soon observes the risks that come with the overuse of SCP-427. We'll call this subject our mystery member D-Class personnel, the patient. Following exposure to the Lovecraftian locket, the patient's natural resistance to diseases, toxins, and other dangers to their immune system is increased by 500%. And that's only after 10 minutes of healing time from SCP-427. Better than full immunization against anything and everything. Curious to see how much further the locket can improve a subject's natural resistances, if it even can at all, Dr. Gears and his researchers place the patient within the range of SCP-427's regenerative effect once again. This time, the exposure goes on for an extra 5 minutes, taking the duration up to 15 Monitoring all of the patient's vitals and charting any internal or external bodily change, the research team noticed that the patient seems to be getting stronger. Their muscular system is optimized, as if someone has programmed their body to its peak level of performance. Conducting further testing, Dr. Gears determined that the patient's pain tolerance and overall physical strength shows an increase of between 200 and 300 percent. Then they try exposing the patient again for over an hour this time. And that's when everything goes wrong. Before the researcher's very eyes, the patient's muscle and flesh start to mutate rapidly and uncontrollably. They shift from a normal human to a thing ripped straight out of a nightmare. What the Foundation scientists are only just realizing in the most horrific fashion is that the effects of SCP-427 are cumulative. They stack on top of one another and continued exposure accelerates the amount of time it takes for the human body to apply the changes granted by the locket, meaning that, after so much exposure to SCP-427, the patient is converting at a rapid rate into a sickening, shapeless mass of tissue until they're not even human anymore, but a terrifying beast of nothing but flesh. These flesh beasts, as the researchers take to calling the creatures thanks to their horrific appearance, quickly prove to be highly aggressive. The security personnel that move in to contain the beast that was once the patient learned this in a quick, brutal fashion, as the newly formed flesh beast attacks the guards on sight with messy, fatal results. Drawing their weapons, the surviving security officers open fire at the creature, which shows itself to be highly resistant to conventional firearms. Despite being comprised of flesh, the beast shrugs off bullets like they're little more than minor annoyances. Fortunately for the security personnel who haven't yet been slaughtered, they have a few other less conventional weapons on hand that might just do the trick. It takes a few unsuccessful tries and a lot of waste in ammo, but soon a successful way to neutralize the flesh beast is deployed. It turns out that a sufficient excess of heat, in excess of 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, is enough to cause the flesh beast's bodily mass to combust. Given how aggressive the creatures are towards Foundation personnel during subsequent intentional attempts to recreate them, Dr. Gears and his fellow researchers can't gauge exactly how intelligent the flesh beasts are. But by mapping the biological optimizations that SCP-427 grants a subject, Foundation researchers have determined that the Lovecraftian locket causes a significant enhancement to the brain as well as the muscle and immune systems. After all, the brain is responsible for regulating all bodily functions. This means that the intelligence levels of a fully transformed flesh beast could exceed that of the average human. For now, despite the risks of mutation, SCP-427 is used as a partial replacement for the SCP-500 pills, given their limited number. While the locket is able to cure any ailment that the pills can, total exposure time must be recorded, as the optimizations granted by SCP-427 are cumulative in all subjects. Given the potentially adverse side effects of continued SCP-427 use, only medical staff with a Class 3 clearance level are permitted to handle or use the Lovecraftian locket. The O5 Council deems this to be an acceptable risk, and should anyone show any signs of sufficient mutations, they are to be terminated before they transform into a flesh beast. Any instances of a full mutation, now referred to as SCP-427-1, are to be killed immediately through means of incineration, since they are considered too aggressive to communicate with or experiment on. On second thought, perhaps I was a little too harsh on the Rolexes earlier. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like Top 12 Body-Altering SCP 
that will change you forever.